One of the characteristics of the poverty challenge, I guess, is having to just take responsibility for so many choices, like how much you're going to invest in clean water, whereas in the developed world, we take that for granted, and we don't have to actually think about it. It's not something we're, we don't have to feel responsible for clean water, because it's just all around us. Yeah, we don't, we don't even think about the challenge of having access to clean water. And if we do, it's, it's kind of higher level challenges, yeah. you know, the environmental quality of the water. Does it have too much fluoride in it? Um, whereas for them, it's just getting basic access that will prevent diarrheal diseases, which have real major health impacts um, and, uh, and, and can cause death even in, in a lot of young children. So how, you said that there have been some improvements in the, in, the, in the village in Ghana where you did your Peace Corps work. How did those improvements come back? What come about? What what kinds of things sustained them or initiated them? Sure. Well, I think that they're uh, these are related to kind of larger global trends and mm-hmm. trends within the country as a whole as well. Um, you've seen Ghana. Uh, grow quite a bit economically over the past decade or so. Some of that in recent years, to be clear, is, is due to oil. They, they, right. they had a big oil discovery in 2008, and that brought in wealth. <laughs> and, and it definitely helps. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the reasons. But they were having sustained economic growth since the, the 1990s before that. Um, and some of the story there is better institutions, mm-hmm. uh, a democracy that's functioning better than ever, that's a little more responsive to the needs of, of the broader population. Um, I think as you start to see uh, a rising middle class, which is something that I definitely noticed in the cities in Ghana, right. that rising middle class makes different kinds of demands on the government than what we often would see yeah. before. And and I think that that means that the institutions are finding that they do have to be more responsive. The big campaign campaign issue in the recent election in Ghana, or one of the big campaign issues, was education provision. Interesting. You know, how do we get, how do we improve the provision of education, um, not just in terms of the quality in the cities, but also in terms of um, expanding that to the rural areas, um, such as northern Ghana, where right. I was a volunteer. So the, the role of government is, a, is a, such an interesting issue, because we have you know, some theorists of economic development, for whom governments are always kind of in the way, you know, they, sure. they can, they, they can be more or less harmful, but they, 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 people, some of the economic theorists look down at them. Others see, uh, that without, um, decent government, it doesn't have to be excellent, but without decent government, poverty is just never going to be addressed. And tell us a little bit about your work in Syria and, and the contemporary views about, um, the, I guess the politics of poverty, or what the what is the what is the connection between prosperity and decent government? Yeah, well, that definitely underlies a lot of the discourse on uh, on, on aid in general over the last couple of decades. So, if we're thinking about institutions, um, work by uh, Darno Samoglu and uh, uh, and Jim Robinson and others have really underscored the idea that good institutions could really under um, provide kind of the the underpinnings for for strong development in many countries. Um, And bad institutions, we often hear from uh, thinkers ranging from Debisa Moyo, who has this great book um, called Dead Aid, which is very critical about uh, the role of aid, uh, and uh, and, and the work of, of, of Bill Easterly and others, which really suggests that, as you said, government gets in the way, partly because government doesn't always have the same interest right. as the extreme poor in these countries. Right. Um, when they're receiving aid, they're receiving aid perhaps because it will facilitate um, their ability to um, uh, gain the support of clients mm-hmm. and kind of a pa- yeah. patronage type systems yeah. that, they, that, that, that often uh, underscore political development in much of Africa. Um, and so for them, <laughs> aid is as much a problem as you know, the so-called resource curse. Um, there's a great book um, by uh, uh, Scott Strauss and David Leonard, which talks ab- about that linkage between, yeah. um, they, the book is called Stalled Development, and it, t- and it really kind of compares, it says aid can be just as bad as an oil shock. We're, we're very familiar with the oil curse and how that um, can disrupt the incentives of government. But to the extent that governments are the gatekeepers for these aid deliveries, um, that aid can go to lots of other purposes besides helping the extreme poor, and that's the problem. But if a government is responsive to the people, mm-hmm. to the extent that that happens, as that as the institutions improve, then 
that aid delivery, people are going to want the government to be accountable. They're going to, they're going to want to know where that money yeah. is going. And as that improves, and as the government sees that it can gain itself or its survival yeah. is linked to the livelihoods of the poor or the extreme poor, then that also can 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 support better methods of, of, of aid delivery in these countries. So uh, this may be too simple, sure. but but um, it, it, the aid. Um, can be an incentive to, for corruption. I mean, that's is, is that is you know, yeah. there's yeah. so much money around, and if the government is not responsible, if the government sees itself almost like a private actor or, or private group, um, that that money can actually incent- can can be redirected to its own personal interests. So it, what we would normally call corruption, we've seen it in different parts of the world, but we've also seen governments become more responsive, as you say, yeah. and. And I suppose if they're more responsive, not to their own private interests, but to the public good, um, that, that that you'll have a reduction in corruption um, because the, the public will demand that because they're not participating in the benefits that the corrupt officials would have. Sure. Ha- what are some of the factors that move a, gr- a society from from that trap of corruption or a bad government to a more responsive one. What are some of the things that make a government more responsive in these I mean, that's, situations? That's the big question. I don't think any of us have a very good idea on how to do that. Um, we, there are a lot of ideas on explaining why it is, often based on kind of historical trajectories. And uh, um, you know, the the work by Asim Oglu and Robinson really focuses on kind of the unique historical context that countries like Botswana um, had, and that favored their good institutions. Um, there are some that link Ghana's success to uh, um, conditionality in aid programs, but we know that conditionality hasn't had the Doesn't same positive work. impacts yeah. in other countries. So it's, it's not clear to me that we know how external actors can impact those kinds of changes. Mm-hmm. I think at some level, those kinds of changes and demands for improvement in governance really have to come from people within these countries, what right. we can do maybe is try to facilitate the space in which they can act to, uh, to, 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 to do that um, and, uh, and make sure that international incentives align in ways that, that improve that. It may mean that, as some suggest, that some countries should not be given aid or should right. be limited in, in the kind of aid that is delivered because of its ability to foster those kinds of corrupt practices. Not an easy solution here. So, um, you know, the World Bank makes this uh, uh, case that uh, sustainable uh, development is inclusive development. And I, I guess inclusion is another wor- word for something like democracy or at least participation sure. in the public sphere. Sure. Um, and I know one of the things we've talked about in this class is uh, not just the allevi- alleviation of suffering, important though that is, but um, the alleviation of suffering that, that gives a person a chance to be on a ladder of prosperity, on a, on a trajectory of economic growth. Could you give us, I mean, maybe you can just give us an example of a country where it's worked, knowing, of course, that the, those particular conditions may not translate to another place. But is there a, is there a success story that, for people in, in the field, seems to give them hope that, um, transitions can happen in a positive direction. Transitions economically, politically. Well, all the, I guess we're looking for a place where the the transition, the economic and the political tra- transitions align yeah. and are mutually supportive. Ghana, of course, is one case that I'm familiar with, right. and, and where you do see some of that occurring, uh, and where the, uh, the the at the same time that we've seen economic growth, we've seen strong moves to democratization and a multi-party system that's functioning, and um, where elections change parties. Uh, uh, change who's in power, and is that because basis. of this middle, the middle class that is developing? I wouldn't say it's because of the middle class. I would say that that has helped foster a rising middle class, which in turn might be creating beginning a virtuous circle. But you know, it's it's not that the the middle class is yet there in terms of having the power. It's just it's starting to become a factor. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the uh, that the story there is that. International incentives really aligned for that country to uh, to benefit from sending signals to the rest of the world that they are a functioning democracy. Right. Uh, that uh, we did a lot as an international community to support Rawlings in his right. um, um, decision to step down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not that easy for other countries. Yeah. You know, if you want to move Zimbabwe onto that trajectory, right. for instance, their starting point is is so different right. um, that uh, it's it's unclear to me. 
um, how you would provide the incentives to those in power to, to move in that direction right. at this point. The challenge of of moving forward in those kinds of directions um, are huge. I think the best we can do, um, rather than think about those kind of big push transformational yep. projects, is really just concentrate on finding um, ways to deliver aid that works at, at the local yeah. level uh, and, and really paying attention. So one of the recent books that came out this past year, Ben Ramilongan's book on um, uh, uh, on aid at the edge of chaos. Aid, looks aid at, on the edge of chaos. Aid on the edge uh-huh. of chaos. He looks at uh, applying complexity theory to the world of aid. And it's gotten a lot of press over the last year, and it's partly because he's doing some very interesting things methodologically with thinking about complexity theory, which, of course, had its beginnings in math and science. But he notes that some of what we need to consider, and he uses the ex- uh, experience of agricultural development in Bali to underscore the story he wants to tell, is that we need to really pay attention to local knowledge. Yeah. And if we don't do that, and if we're not paying attention to how local systems have developed um, and been generated on their own, um, and we just come in with our own ideas, we can actually disrupt systems that work. And what, what is a better thing for us to do is to find ways to expand the space, the capacity you know, that, that, that the systems have to continue to evolve and maybe move on in new directions and different directions, rather than trying to alter those systems directly necessarily. Paying attention to local knowledge uh, and trying to find, I guess what you might call, emergent possibilities there in the scene rather than come in with a model that might have worked across the globe or in your own country and try to impose it. That seems to be to you more, more fruitful as a way of uh, approaching these issues. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and we see a lot of work in, those, in that vein that's emerging uh, over the last decade or so. Mm-hmm. Um, we've actually had a number of students at Wesleyan, for instance, work with um, a group called Innovations for Poverty Action that's associated also with MIT's Poverty Action right. Lab. And, and we've had students work with uh, MIT there as well. Yeah. And uh, those programs are really trying to find out what does work mm-hmm. um, when it comes to altering people's behavior, for right. instance, encouraging people to use mosquito nets yeah. um, and, 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 and that type of thing. So when it comes to those kinds of projects, what we often see um, these researchers do is they, they take an, an aid concept, an aid idea, right. and they apply it. Um, in a random way um, across uh, a, a geographic area. So some villages will, you know, be given this so-called treatment, and others right. will not. Right. And uh, and the idea is to figure out: well, given that these populations are mostly similar, mm-hmm. um, are those that receive a certain message or that receive, you know, free bed nets versus right. bed nets that um, that that, are, that they have to pay for? Right. Um, how does that affect the ultimate outcomes that we're looking for? Um, and uh, and that research is really starting to inform a lot of our thinking. And some of it's scalable, right. and some of it we discover is not. That there might be limits to that. It might be that you know what we're learning is about what works within a given um, set of contextual p- parameters. Yeah. Yeah. So that the the local knowledge you get is just local. <laughs> so, so exactly, and, exactly. And, but that's, and that's fine. Okay. Just, and that's yeah. fine. And you know, and if we think about. You know, one of the things I think about when I think about where work on development and aid is going Mm -hmm. is as we start to see the rest of these countries rise economically, Mm -hmm. um, it may be, too, that some of the challenges that they're experiencing aren't that different from the challenges that the poor experience in the developed world as well, or that at least that we've had experiences dealing with over the last century um, and as we've risen in the United States um, and in Europe as well. And so it may be that we begin to start to see that there are ways in which what the work we've done um, will start to pay off in terms of how we understand what what can work in, in these other contexts as well, and that's something I, that that kind of excites me. Yeah. And, and, yeah. I, and I see a lot of students starting to draw those connections as well. So when the students who come to your classes are they are they mostly interested in economics? Are they mostly interested in politics? Or do they not? Make the distinction because it, 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 they overlap seems sure. so great. Yeah, no, there is a lot of overlap. I, I think that uh, I mean they come to me to, to to my classroom with a lot of different interests. Mm-hmm. Some of them are interested. A lot of them are interested in poverty overall mm-hmm. um, as an issue, but their ideas about 
um, what matters for poverty or, 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 um, or how to connect with that issue of poverty are, are often very different. We have a lot of students, for instance, that take my classes that are at the College of Environments as well. Uh-huh. And so they can link their concerns about poaching right. to the economic livelihoods of those that have relied on that trade, or they link their concerns about climate change yeah. to, uh, to, to how that impacts um, um, the poor as well. And, and definitely that does have major impacts. Rainfall shocks, we know, right. um, ha- um, you know whether it's drought or, f- or floods, right. um, it impacts the provision of impacts food security for the yeah. for the extreme poor, and it, it can even lead to violence. Um, some research has suggested. Yes, and and so, um, the, the, and then when you have a this cycle of violence or um, uh, social disturbances, um, you're you're clearly in the political realm. Sure, but if the causes of that that uh, the, those occurrences are coming out of economics, they're very hard, they become very hard to separate. Yeah, well, uh, these issues are interrelated. You know, I think we can't just separate out the economics from the politics, mm-hmm. um, from the environmental concerns, from um, from, from from social concerns, cultural concerns as well. If we think about, you know, the, the concerns about the spread of HIV and AIDS and right. the role of contraception, we got religion and culture yeah. that also yeah. often plays a role in, in debates about how to approach those issues. We have seen over the last, um, you know, 50 years a pretty significant reduction in extreme poverty. And mm-hmm. I know, you know, major organizations like the World Bank are, and, and others and, uh, have set this, uh, aggressive targets for you know, reducing poverty uh, over the next uh, 10 to 25 years. Um, what, how optimistic are you about the, these efforts? What do you, what do you see? Well, what do you see? I'm somewhat optimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, and, you know, I know that the World Bank, for instance, has set a goal of eradicating extreme poverty by 2030. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and that seems to me in some ways ambitious. You know, we've talked, you, you can talk about the Millennium Development Goals, which right. also had similar kind of um, high hopes. And we, we're not quite meeting all those Millennium Development Goals as we approach 2015 when some of them are, are, are due to be assessed. And nevertheless, we have seen progress. Yeah. And I do think that, well, I'm skeptical about completely eliminating extreme poverty, um, especially the transitional sort, which we also experience right. in the U.S. Um, we might get to a point where, where structurally the number of people that are in those situations um, are, are very small. And what that will rely on, though, is not just what we do in terms of aid and right. development, but in terms of thinking about um, the global economy and whether right. it's going to continue to grow, whether or not China continues yeah. to um, have a demand for the raw materials that yeah. they source in Africa, whether or not African countries can find a way to move out of the business of exporting raw materials into creating more value-added yeah. goods or, as some countries are trying to do, leapfrog the industrial age and right. move into the technological age and, uh, and, yeah. and, uh, and uh, expand their IT sectors. There's big yeah. projects, for instance, to create um, information technology cities in, uh, in Kenya and in Ghana um, with the idea that this is, this is where they could specialize if they, if they just put the right resources into it. So there is a great is place where education is is a, a, a key part of the dynamic for yeah. addressing poverty, and education is I guess feeds right back to the political system. So sure. once again, where the, the those 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 fields are really closely intertwined. Um, in a class like ours, uh, we'll have students who uh, are, are very concerned about uh, the issues of, of economic development and poverty um, and are eager to find ways to um, uh, draw the right kind of attention to these issues or make some difference in in um, how we th- uh, think about um, uh, the alleviation of suffering and the promotion of economic growth. and. Uh, any suggestions for how students can get involved, um, uh, sure. play a role that's positive in this in this very difficult realm? Yeah, well, I, I have some kind of broad general su- suggestions to begin with, I guess. Um, so, uh, it, you know, the one word that I would like to stress is facilitate. I think that one thing we can all do is try to find ways to facilitate development, economic growth, and the reduction of extreme poverty mm-hmm. um, across the uh, across the globe, but especially in developing countries. And in order to do that, um, I think that we do need to think uh, about 
not just how we give aid, but also um, our policies and behaviors that begin at home. Yeah. Um, we need to think about, for instance, um, the role that America's trade policy has mm-hmm. on the uh, economic potential of developing countries. Right. Uh, we need to think about the role that um, w- we play in terms of trying to solve the problems of climate change. Mm-hmm. Um, all of these things might actually have greater impacts in the long run over the ability of um, developing countries to, to, to raise themselves out of these situations where they have large populations living in extreme poverty. Um, beyond that, if we're thinking about how do I give um, and, and where do I give, uh, you know, we can give in terms of ourselves, in terms of volunteering. We can give in terms of trying to find ways to set up new institutions that mm-hmm. will uh, facilitate development. Um, we can give in terms of just giving money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are strengths and weaknesses to all these approaches. Um, I think if you're going to develop a new institution, um, you should make sure that you have a very good reason for doing so. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges that some developing countries have um, is that there are too many people doing yeah. this. Um, so uh, one uh, story about Ethiopia's Ministry of Health is that mm-hmm. um, half their time is spent talking to donors um, really? rather than working on developing health policy that could benefit the population. Yeah. Um, and so they have a very fragmented aid system where there's lots of people giving small amounts of money and they have to pay attention to all those flows. And, and on one level, that's welcome. But we, we do want to think about maybe there are ways we can be more coherent globally right. in how we approach this. And so keeping that in mind is something that, that I would encourage your students to do. But if you are going to give, um, Eric Friedman has a book on reinventing philanthropy. I don't know if you've come across it. Um, and one of his key distinctions is between the do-gooder and the do-bester. And the do-gooder is someone who's focused primarily um, on trying to do some good in the world, Mm -hmm. but is doing that partly because they know they're going to get some satisfaction and because of the personal connection they might feel to um, to those issues. Um, The do-bester is much more focused on the outcomes. They want to know, well, where can I have the greatest impact in terms of where my giving is going to go? And so... One thing I would suggest that your students do is really pay attention to the, that. What yeah. are the big issue areas yeah. where they can have the biggest impact? Often it's in public health and education, issues we've already touched on. Yeah. Um, you know, thinking about you know, which organizations are more efficient. There are, there, are, there are increasingly a number of institutions that are trying to rate yes. private NGOs yeah. and, and aid agencies yeah. um, on their ability to deliver outcomes. And one of those is Giving Well, for instance. And Giving Well is one of those institutions that tries to help us sort out. Because it takes a lot of work yeah. um, to kind of figure out, you know, who's, who's actually benefiting yeah. um, the extreme poor. Um, and so that's, that's another piece to this, I would say, as well.